Yes, man, I'm live. We're lonesome. I'm, I'm up. I'm up. I'm up with the comrade leader. Right? Yes, yeah, man. Hear what happened now? Hear what happened? Because just explain my little fault, yeah? My fault. Because what happened is when the comrade leader was on the last time and him, and him said him, him, him have to run for a meeting, right? What happened is when I, when I remove him, it automatically put a block on him. So I never, you know, you know, when I try them saying black and, uh, you know, get scattered up and call my daughter and then free it up. How are you doing? How are you doing, sir? Great. Glad to be with you again, Wayne. You know, thank yes, you for having me back. I appreciate it. Yes, man. All right. So we have a lot of questions to ask today, you know, because the people them say, yes, we have to bring back the opposition leader. You understand? Because yes. the country really are running a turmoil. So we, we could start from parliament. But... This time we're going to use some clippings, some visual. This visual are from you talking to the government about the uncaring ways them anger the people and then we want you to respond. Make us just play it, play a little touch of it, and then you can just respond to it, right? Pot a cook, but the food is not enough. A hungry man is an angry man. Act now, Prime Minister. Push on the crisis. Recast the budget. Address the cries of the people. We on this side are recommending the following benefits that need to be substantially increased in the coming fiscal year. Path benefits, poor relief, the amount spent on social pensions for those who are not receiving NIS or public sector pensions. Inflation, especially the cost of basic food items, is taking away their ability to survive. These are our most vulnerable Jamaicans. They need and they deserve the protection of the government at this time of raging inflation, and they're not getting it. Yes, can you give me a follow-up on that? Because, I mean, the inflation taking me... Well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what else to say, but can you just give me a follow-up on this? Because it's really beating our people pocket. Boy, Wayne, it's a very terrible situation. All right, so we know we're just coming out of the two years of this pandemic. And the pandemic disrupted the world economy, especially the, what we call the supply chain. In other words, the movement of goods from one country to another. Shipping prices have gone up substantially. And also, because people couldn't move around because of lockdown and those things, people's spending habits changed around the world. So people were spending less on services like going out, restaurants, uh, entertainment, etc., and we're shopping for more goods, hard um, items. And that put a lot of pressure on manufacturers all over the world to supply the increased demand for goods. And that resulted in prices also being pushed up. So what we have seen, for example, for the 12 months from February last year to February this year, the rate of inflation went above 10% for that 12 months, right? That's the general rate of inflation. I remember... How they measure inflation in Jamaica. Statin has a basket of goods. And they have, in this basket, they have hundreds of items, a wide range of items. And they, they monitor the movement of prices of all those items. And they calculate what is the kind of average movement. And that gives you the inflation rate over the period. However, for individuals, depending on what they consume, the actual inflation that they experience can be significantly different to the official exchange, um, inflation rate. And as we have found out, certainly for many basic food items, the prices over the last 12 months have gone up much more than 10%. In fact, sometimes 40 50%. And the price of gas from the pump from February to February, last year to this year, is 60%. So, you know, so that is what has been hitting the people now. Plus now, when you factor in the effect of the war in Ukraine, that's a whole nother story of pressure on prices because Ukraine and Russia are major producer of grains. Grains are wheat that make flour and all flour products. Corn that make all corn products and animal feed and all of that. Plus, Ukraine is a major producer of agricultural fertilizer and agricultural chemicals. So, you know, say, what is happening there? They, their economy will have been totally disrupted. 
sanctions have been imposed on Russia by the Western countries, which means that they are not, not able to export as they usually could. So there's a shortage. There is going to, there's an unfolding crisis of prices and availability of goods as a result of that situation in Ukraine on top of what was already happening as a result of the pandemic. So when we cite up that now, Wayne, and we see the budget that they tabled, we're saying this budget is a kind of business-as-usual budget. In other words, there was no special arrangements in the budget to increase the protection for those who can hardly survive because they are earning so little or nothing. So that is why I was saying in the budget, Prime Minister, Finance Minister, cushion the crisis, cushion it. And the way I said you could cushion it, Wayne, is this. We have been bringing down our public debt, our national debt as a country for the last seven, eight years. It was 147% of GDP. What that mean? That means that if the, if the GDP is this size, the debt was about one and a half times the size of the, of the, of the economy yeah, itself. Yes, yes. Yeah, it wasn't sustainable. So a lot of work had to be done when we were in government from 2012 to 2016 to fix that. And we were successful in delivering the reforms that have enabled that to be substantially improved. So by the time we left office in 2016, instead of 147% of GDP, it was 115% of GDP, much smaller. And those policies and, uh, have continued to bear fruit much more revenue coming into the government, even though they boast about no net new taxes, meaning, yes, they've imposed new taxes, but they haven't, well, they've also reduced some taxes, like the 1.5. So they say no net new taxes. But the revenue, the tax money that they're collecting has gone up very, very steeply over the last six years, very, very steeply. So this has created opportunities, and the debt has been coming down. The pandemic liquid and... The economy rock, tourism shut down basically, entertainment shut down, um, transport reduced because Pitney school, people are working from home, all of that. So the economy shut down by over 10% in 2020. And it, as a result of the shrinking of the economy, the debt again, relative to the economy, went up from about 94% where it was by that time, back up to 110 but then in 2021, as things started to improve again, it started come down. And as at the end of March now, it's about 96, 97% of GDP. So it's, the debt is actually smaller than the economy now, which is good. And the plan is, and the program is to take it to 60% of GDP by the end of March 2028. And what I was saying is this, given this crisis that we're in now, we're all committed to bringing that debt down. But let's just slow up the pace of bringing it down and use some of those resources to provide the cushion for the crisis. And I said, look, 2% of GDP, $40 billion, you could allocate up to that amount over the course of this year till the crisis settle down and give the people some help. Because people are feeling it and it is only going to get worse. That is how I see it. You know what I mean? Hopefully, hopefully, Things will not be as 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 dread as they appear that they might be. They're already bad. But um, I'm saying we must plan to protect the people. So this is why I was calling for strengthen path, increase the path benefit because with inflation and lick path is already less than it was in real terms. Same for poor relief. Same for um the social pension for the elderly who are not getting NI. Even those who are getting NIS, it can't, it, they must struggle the same way. So I was saying, look, help the farmers too, because we, we know, say, what the chicken price has gone up, and what the government wanted to do in response was to just issue some chicken license, some import license for chicken to some man. Usually it's friend and company get them thing there. Because that money is, yeah, man, it's pure, that, that is easy money for bringing, because them, them wave the duties on it, so it come in cheap. And sell off fast. Mm -hmm. So it's a very profitable thing. But we're saying, listen, it's not a situation where our producers, our, and I remember tens of thousands of, of people in Jamaica raise chicken and sell for, 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 to, to help put food on the table. You know? So we're I saying, mm -hmm. since the supply is not a problem, it's just the price because of the feed and everything that get expensive. 
instead of giving permits to people to import and giving up revenue when you drop the duty to allow them to import, take that money there and provide a subsidy to the farmers for the period That's of this true. crisis. And, was, mm -hmm. and reduce the price and make sure that they pass it through to the consumers. That is where you have to monitor it carefully. You know, you have your Consumer Affairs Commission and, you know, you have your Minister of, Minister of Agriculture and you have the public, you and me and everybody who are listening, say, well, this is what it should be coming to the retail at and, you know, monitor them thing there and give the farmers a chance to, to continue to... But what I didn't like was the idea of importing chickens that are going to kill the local producers because at the end mm. of the day that is not sustainable for us we food security mean we have to we have to protect our producers so that was one of the ideas of how i thought part of that 40 billion could be used for that and you know mm. there are a couple of other little things i was looking at like the online shopping where many people know you know looking at bargain things that are not produced here them buy it online but when they when come in here, they only get 50 US dollar duty free, and the rest now they have to pay the full tax. And, and I was saying, mm -hmm. give them a break too, because those are people, especially young people, trying to economize. So give them $150 duty free instead of the $50. You know? So those are some of the ideas that we put out there for the government to consider. Because I'm always, I say, we, we just are criticized and we're not give, you know, we're not saying anything constructive, which is not true. But our our budget presentations were full of many ideas. Um now, to be very honest, the, the, the finance mm. minister closed the budget debate today. I ha I was not able to attend because I had to be in my constituency this afternoon because there was a big thing going on down there and I felt responsible to make sure I was there for that. So I haven't heard what he has said yet, but I gather he has said he was going to do something like to do with JPS and things, some 20% thing, but I don't get a chance to study it yet because I'm just coming from a constituency now race to get back here in time for this for this show but right. i don't think he has done enough from what i'm hearing i don't think he's done enough so 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 we in the truth of the matter is this is a time when i feel that jamaica close to the brink we're close to the brink you know because sure. people have been suffering hard with this inflation and it's going to get worse and i feel you know i i understand when the, the top on rs then say, no, you know, we must put, focus, bring down the debt, bring down the debt. And we are committed to that, you know. Remember, so I tell you, say, we bring it from 147% of GDP. Yeah, to 100. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. In just four years, in just four years, you know. Yes. So we are fully committed. And we set the thing. We set the thing with the reforms of that period to improve the tax system so that the, a lot more is now collected than used to be the case. And that is helping us to pay down the debt. But when, you, when you're on a journey and something happened to the vehicle. You don't just press on if you can do something for me to protect the vehicle. I'm not going to move none at all. Yeah. Cushion the crisis. That's what I was really calling for because I feel that society needs that kind of protection right now because people are struggling at the heights where, you know, I think it's not good. I don't think we should just leave the people unprotected in the situation that they're in. You just said something very important, yeah? You said um, they want to bring in some license for them friend and company that them can give waivers, right? Mm -hmm. And now think about the masses of people who are hungry, even the chicken farmer, those poor little farmers who sell back them chicken maybe to best dresser to some other company that it works. Them want to wipe out that completely. These are the things about us. You understand? Okay. We want leaders who think about the people. Yeah. Self-reliance we're talking about now, right? That's right. I I, I, what, what I want to ask you about now, the $2,000 bill. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we have a crisis. And instead, because we know it takes money to print money. We have a crisis. And, 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 and then come up with this Michael Manley with Edward Siago. I think it is ingenuous. I yeah. think it, it, it hurt a lot of people. What what you take on it? Because this it, it shouldn't be them. They consult you. The the government consult the opposition about doing these things. No, they did not. They just came to Parliament with a big poster with the pictures of the, what the new banknotes are going to look like, and it was pure hype in there. But I said, look, that is disrespect because when you Michael Manley is on the thousand dollar bill now by himself 
when you say well, you were bringing a $2,000 bill now and put Michael Mann and Eddie Siaga on the same note, mm. and you don't consult with the People's National Party, you say you consult with the family. Well, I've, you know, they have said certain things that they are not happy with it. That's mm. what they have been saying since then. But it's not just a family matter. You know, Michael Manley was an icon of our movement. And a lot of our supporters and feel very strongly about him as a man who delivered the most liberating government in the history of Jamaica in, in the 1970s. Okay. So when you make a move like that and you don't consult with us, it's just disrespect. And a lot of people feel that it's a wrong move. And, you know, there are issues around the 1970s, Wayne, which are still not adequately resolved, you know, because we, we know... We need and conciliation about that. Correct. Thing. Correct. We've had no truth and reconciliation type process about yes. it. What we yes. Have is a, what all we have is a, an attempt to revision, revise history and treat the, sanitize the history, make the history something which it was not. And we know what was going on then. And we know the undermining and the destabilization of the government of the time. And we know the CIA was present in Jamaica working towards that because That's true. there was this story being spread that, P that Michael Manley was a communist. And Michael Manley was a committed yeah, yeah. Democrat. He was a full-fledged committed Democrat, believed in the participation of the people and the importance of having the, the legitimacy of the people choosing their government through free, free and fair elections. That's what he stood for. So that was a whole distortion of history to, um, and a distortion of the reality of the time that undermined what were the, the, the social programs and the economic reforms that were being attempted then to make Jamaica a more fair and just society. So look, I'm not trying to try, you know, dig up ghosts of the past and create uh, negative vibes. But I'm saying those are issues that many people who live through that period still feel strongly about. And when you're going to put the two of them on the same banknote and you don't consult with us, what kind of reaction do you expect? And I can tell you, many people, of our, uh, many of our supporters are very, very upset about it. People and I dare say right. probably some labor rights are very, very upset about people it. Because right. yeah. they have their yeah. own understanding of that period too. So I'm saying... You know, if you're going to make a move like that, you have to consult. You have to, there has to be a process. And what bound me not win is that I, because I know the family and I've been in discussion with them and I'm hearing that this has been talked about for a couple of years. It's not like a son thing. This is something that they have been working on for some time, but they never bring it to our attention. You know, we had Veil Royal talks a couple of weeks ago, not mentioned. So we just them just drop it on we saw in the hype of a budget debate. So we, you know, I had to respond to it, and I did. And uh, you know, I I said, look, let's leave my command on a one thousand dollar bill. If you want to create a new bill, if you think there needs to be a two thousand dollar bill, no problem. And you want to put Mr. Siaga on the bill, fine, do that. But don't disturb Joshua. On the you one know what? Bill. You know what hurt a lot of people? Can hurt me too. When mm -hmm. I heard the finance minister said, you know, rival, rival, uh, it's rival. You know, mm -hmm. they put Monday and Sagot, it's rival, and the same one. Rival? What them going back to? <laughs> you know, that hurt us. That hurt yeah. us. You know, yeah. and I know yeah. you're in parliament and you can talk to them about this, but you cannot deal with the, the masses of people like this. No. I'm going to play next. I'm going to play something on next visual. With the prime minister, right? Because we're we play some vigil and then ask some questions, you know, because we'll do some things where, you know, all right. Come on. I'm gonna go play this one. All right. This one. Where some people were starstruck and forgot their senses. I believe that. I could have played from the top. With what I saw yesterday, where some people were starstruck and forgot their senses. I believe they should be fine. <laughs> Minister Grange, who, who is used to being among stars and kept her mask on, I am appointing you, Minister, to collect $100,000 from every minister who was here. And, and Madam Speaker, and, and Madam Speaker, make a donation to a worthy charity. 
Yes. Or to the defense of anyone who is so charged. All right. So, so my question is this now, right? Mm -hmm. As a prime minister in the house, these things, what him does mention about, what he mentioned about the other day, it enter on the record in the house, right? It, yeah. It's in a, on record. Mm -hmm. How is it a prime minister who is not a police, not a judge? Yeah, you're a learned lawyer. How is it a prime minister? God, this more look like a dictatorship to me. Can you explain this to me? Because it's more than wrong. Because yeah. a lot of people have paid 200,000 for mask. Yeah. Who do have the money? 700,000. Yeah. And this prime minister tell a, a, a member of his cabinet to collect 100,000, even under them are right money. And he might be a judge, jury, executioner, everything together. What your take on this? Because it's outrageous, you know. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Well, Wayne, I have a back up a little if you don't mind. When the Disaster Risk Management Act was being amended a year ago, February. 2021, I warned Parliament that the way they were doing it was wrong and dangerous because what the way they did it was that they said that the breach of any order made under that act, which is by the Prime Minister who makes those orders, is a criminal offence. That's what they did. So it meant that the, the Prime Minister was given the power to determine what is criminal and what is not criminal in terms of conduct that is unheard of that the is Lord, that is well on well on there mr mm. golden that that sounds like a dictatorship to me it is ha it has the potential for it okay. because if the, because if the order says that if you go across this line is a is a criminal offense them can charge you for that and lock you up or if you do y or x or z and i'm saying no whatever is to become an offence must come to Parliament and be approved by the elected representatives of the people. That is, that's the way the system is supposed to work. So that's the first thing that went wrong. The second thing that went wrong at the time was they told us, and the law provided for it, that any breaches of these orders would be subject to a ticket. And they published what the, tic the ticketed fines would be to pay the ticket. So, for example, for a mask violation, it was supposed to be five thousand dollar. Curfew violation was ten thousand dollar. But then, having persuaded everybody that this is safe and don't have no, because the fines are relatively manageable amount, even though that's enough money still. Yes. But in the scheme of things, of what transpired after, it was a different kettle of fish. They never implemented the ticketing system. So when a youth left him yard to go a shop after curfew because they might have to buy something or have to go over the yard across the road because they might beg them some this or that. And the police pass by and see him and hold him. There's no ticket for game. And what that means, they have to go to court. And under the same Disaster Risk Management Act, if it go to court, the maximum fine is $1 million. And it can be punishable by imprisonment, I think, for up to six months. So easy. what you had was a lot, of, a lot of youths and a lot of people ended up being prosecuted, charged and prosecuted. There being no ticketing system and the judges seeing that a, thousand, a million dollars a maximum fine were levying these incredibly disproportionate and unfair fines and ignoring the published rates for the tickets, which is what we were told in Parliament was the amount that should be paid for those things. So $5,000 became $200,000. Wow. And it, it really sick my stomach, may I tell you the truth. And some people couldn't afford to pay it. Some people have to borrow money for pay it. And some people couldn't pay it and end up spending 30 days in jail because they couldn't pay the fine. So now, when the Prime Minister comes into Parliament, because there's this big embarrassment where five of his mm. ministers were at a very public event and were filmed without masks on. And come and talk about, well, him is going to fine him $100,000 and Babsy must collect the fine. That was a gimmick. That was just a joke thing. That's why they were all laughing and beating them dead. That is so disrespectful to the masses of people in Jamaica. 
Oh, yeah, because the masses of people in Jamaica have to obey the law. And if they don't, the law is enforced against them. And I've just described what that is. But when friend and company, again, politically connected persons um, are caught red-handed, so to speak, the approach of the prime minister to dealing with them was to come to parliament and say, Babsy, collect $100,000 from each of them and give it to a charity. or for, There's no basis in law for that. The prime minister has no power to fine anybody. One. You yes. can't collect no fine from nobody. Mm. Fines are imposed by the court after you are charged or you get a ticket. In some instance, like motor vehicle fines and so can be done through a ticket. So we felt that this was really disrespectful to the people of Jamaica who had had to suffer the indignity and oppression of the system that was supposed to be covered by tickets and was not for a year. So, you know, I felt it was very unfortunate. Now, look, the whole thing about the mask wearing and, the, you know, and the, and the curfew and thing, to me, that, that shouldn't have even been dealt with in the way it was in terms of having people brought before the court and do jail time for them thing there and massive fines and all that. It, it, the whole thing was oppressively done and it was, uh, uh, I would say, very chaka-chaka on the part of the government at the time and the, and I would say the Attorney General at the time has some, some of the blame to, should carry some of the blame for it because she should have advised them not to go that route if the ticketing system was not ready and, they, and there was no reason to assume that they that they could get it ready in a reasonable period of time. So anyway, that is what happened. And that is why, you know, when after the, the prime minister said that, you know, in parliament that he's finding his friends $100,000 each, we had to object to it and say, no, this is not, this is a, this is an, an offense and disrespect to the rule of law and to the yeah. people of Jamaica who have had the rule of law enforced against them in a very unjust and oppressive way. And it's not a joking matter because, you know, people's lives have been adversely impacted by that, the way in which this thing was rolled out from February last year right through till the thing expired last Friday. Yeah, we we'll keep it true, we, 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 we keep it true, you know, and honest, yeah? When we ask my question, I keep it true and honest. And next thing, the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, um, Bruce Colin, uh, he was the opposition leader before when they come up with the traffic guru thing. I do more than one thing on it because I know it was no mothers of all corruption where they mm. make it sound and make it out to be. And, and you know, tell the masses of people so much lies. And then, no prime minister can we see him in the next speech? I can play that when him said the mothers of all corruption. It does prove in, in court there is nothing about the mothers of all corruption. So what them going to tell to the people of Jamaica, oh, you look at that, the traffic guru are fierce. With these yeah. people telling people so much lies and people believe in these kind of foolishness. Yeah. Why, Wayne? The traffic guru situation was one where each political party has to raise money to conduct its business. No the more. JLP raise money, the PNP no raise money. Mm-hmm. We raise money from supporters. We raise money from corporate donors. I know. You know, and especially when it comes to fighting election, when you, you know that's an expensive thing. Yes. Advertising, T-shirt, all that palaver. So, Trafigura offered a donation to the People's National Party. And the People's National Party were happy to accept it. They said they wanted it to be gone through. And as many corporate donors do, they don't want to have the check made directly to the, in the name of the party because they don't want to be victimized if it ever comes out, that kind of thing, um, in, a, in a tribal political environment. So they asked for another bank account to be used. The general secretary at the time, as I understand it, provided that, and the money was paid over. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the bank leaked it to Bruce Golding. Mm-hmm. And Bruce Golding came out and said, scandal, scandal, scandal. It was very hi- hypocritical, really, I think, because the truth of the matter is, as I've said, donations flow to both everywhere. everywhere, wherever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And at that time, we, we have some rules now that um, 
govern campaign finance that require certain paperwork to accompany it and so on. The rules back then were much more um, relaxed and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, eventually the Dutch government, from where Traffic Guru is a Dutch company, under yes. their law, they're not allowed to make political donations or, or, del or donate money to governments. Yes. And they were, because of this came coming out now, it appeared to the Dutch authorities that maybe Traffic Gora had breached that rule. We yes. have no, we had no such rule at the time that we no. that you couldn't receive this donation. So no, nobody has ever been accused of any breach of Jamaican law. Nobody has been, and there are, we have a Corruption Prevention Act and mm -hmm. there are offenses around corruption there. Not, that was never alleged. Trafigura in the Netherlands, where they have a strict rule about not giving donations to, to governments, and mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in Dutch law, but that is my understanding of it. They were charged. And because we have a mutual legal assistance arrangement between which we didn't have at the time, by the way. The DLP, the, yes. the DLP implemented that when they came yes. into office That's so that means, the yes. Dutch could investigate Trafigura. Mm. Yeah. And obviously for them, this was a convenient thing to, because it was being portrayed as a pain, corruption and so on. Anyway, it has been investigated. The persons who they wanted to have evidence given by came to court and gave their evidence. And essentially, the, all it showed was that, yeah, they made a, a donation to the to a bank account, you know. Okay. But make every major something. company in Jamaica, yes. every major company in Jamaica Donate. gives money to political parties. Let me ask you two questions. Yeah. Let me ask you two questions. One, mm -hmm. I, I know Grace Kennedy and all of them donate money. Every major company. I just talking. But if, if if the government even right now for be fearing of themselves, if you use someone from those company and put him in, in the upper house and turn him into a senator, why you da call that? Because they're doing it right now. So but if, if people look on that, because if I own a company and I donate some money, me I look out for my company interest. So why the command say traffic guru is a corruption? But you have people from private in the upper house as senator we are going to look out for them company interest and it's not a corruption you see them yeah. know what they're doing and it bother me because we want people I, to serve we want people mm -hmm. to serve you know but when they use that 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 kind of method i, I go that way it's going to seem that way to us uh, well you I, see this is it you see mm -hmm. i am not complaining about persons serving no you know, who come from but, the private but they use it yeah, but mm -hmm. I, I understand the point. You're, what you're saying is when you compare that with how they treated yes. Trafigura and they made Trafigura into this big bogeyman, this big Good. scandal, and when it's the dust has now settled and there's really nothing there, mm -hmm. you know, it was a it was a donation to the party. Uh, and you know, who's to say who's to say that the JLP has never got money from Trafigura? I wouldn't know. You know, I I, I I mean, I know there there are other there are other donations that have been made, um, you know, which have come out. Uh, I remember Olint was a big donor, for example. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, they gave to both parties, but they gave one many multiples of what they gave the other. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is, politics was played with this thing. It was a convenient beating stick um, to how it was spun, and everybody jumped on that bandwagon at the time. Yes, and you know it, it cost the PNP heavily, I think, because we we were under this traffic guru cloud. But I'm just very glad that the matter is closed. The yes. chips have fallen where they lie. Well, thinking nobody... Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry about that. Doesn't... No, I'm just saying, and and no, and nobody has been held to have done anything wrong. You know, it was a, a corporate donor to. A political party and that's all it was so you know it's it's for me it's a relief that it's now um over and done with and i was urging you know i was urging the court to do it to deal with it quickly because it's dragged out far too long you know yeah. okay okay i want to play something else
when the prime minister uh, you know was in opposition what him said to the masses of people and like oh, you're you're in opposition now with government in waiting you know um you know if we must all right, make a plate first and then ask you the question hold sure. on make a plate make a plate this one first um Prime Minister saying. Well thinking Jamaicans should raise their voice in concert against the high levels of crime and against the government in not doing enough in controlling crime. All, All right, well thinking so Jamaicans that, that should the raise. Minister, say, that is the opposition leader at the time saying we must hold the government, you know, and the high level of crime. And we must hold the government in everything that's wrong. Hmm. What's, your, what's your take on that? Well, we've seen what has happened with crime under this government, you know, of murder in this society from they took over, went up, stayed up, and they've been trying all kinds of I regard, what I regard as constantly dubious, possibly unconstitutional methods such as emergency as a policing tool. And I've said that repeatedly. And yet the crime levels, the murder levels have been consistently higher. Um, that in January when I put the commissioner and said, listen, man, if you can find a way to deal with this thing. Yes. With days, you know, other than state of emergency, which are not mm -hmm. available because the constitution doesn't allow it to be used that way. And then I better you give somebody else a chance. But we have seen some improvement. Since uh, in, you know February and, and March, we've seen the numbers coming down, and they've been using other techniques, which we said were always available. And I hope it's, you know, I really do. But the truth is that the JLP has over six years a terrible track record on crime and violence, and you know, their the murder rate in the country nationally has been significantly higher each year than it was when we were in office, and we weren't using states of emergency. Police fatal shootings were reduced by 50% when we were in office, you know, and the come came into existence, which was a reform of the JLP. But, you know, it, 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 it was brought into effect and, and, you know, we improvements. But as a combination of bad management and I would say some corruption in the way in which the affairs of the country were being managed, the situation was allowed to get completely out of hand. And um, so, you know, there it is. You have that video of the prime minister saying, well, hold the government responsible, you know, when he was in opposition. As I'm saying, cop mode, kill cop. Yes, yes. All right, the next thing again now. You said six years with the, the present government now. Can you run back on the first three years of Michael Mann, the government in the 70s, and tell me all the other said the first term and mm -hmm. give me all the reform that Michael Maddy come with and this government the whole six years. Hmm. What's the difference? No comparison. No comparison. Yes. In terms of the legacy of what was done in that period for the people of Jamaica. Remember, you know, we got independence in 1962. Buster was the prime. Remember, Norman Manley was the premier of the country. Yes. He believed that in the federation of the West Indies, it would be better as a group of islands charting a common destiny than doing it alone. Mm -hmm. That went to a referendum. All kind of issues were communist ships in the harbor, all kind of all kind of guzzo was brought into it. And the people voted. And then he called an election. The PMP lost that election. JLP under Bustamante were elected in 1962 and brought us into independence, even though they had never been in the struggle for independence. That was always, it was the PNP who struggled for the right to vote for all adult Jamaicans at first, and then for independence for our people. So sometimes that is the way history plays out. So they came into office in 1962, but they never really changed anything in terms of the structure of the society and how the society kept certain people out and kept certain people down. Remember, they banned books, progressive books. They banned Walter Rodney, a great yes, black yes, historian, yes. and mm -hmm. said they declared him first one along grass. He had to leave Jamaica. Yes. And this was a man who wrote How You Developed Africa, a very, very important book. 
and was a lecturer up at UA. So the government of that time was a very conservative and very backward government, in my opinion. And although the economy had been very strong from the 50s going into the bauxite and aluminum industry was growing at that time and was pushing the economy, the wealth disparity between the top, the few, the many mm -hmm. was drastic. Unemployment was high. Malnutrition was So when Michael Manley came into office in 1972 with Better Must Come, that was really when independence began, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because he brought into effect a series of reforms to give the masses of the Jamaican people real status in their own country. First of all, Status of Children's Act, eliminating the notion of bastardy. Prior to that, you know, if you're married, you know, you were a bastard. Yes. And that means you had you couldn't inherit and all kind of you were treated as a second class citizen. Yes. Eliminate that. Mm -hmm. He brought in equal pay for women. Before, prior to that, you could you and a woman would do the same job and she you the, the employer could pay her significantly less than the man, even though she had the same work and have her opinion for feed. Yes, yes ma'am. Eliminated that. Brought in maternity leave with pay. Yes, so that yes, you, yes. A mother can get her salary while she goes off to have her child. Yes. And her child can get the right start because the mother's not under that pressure of not earning. We brought in land lease. A lot of public land and idle land was given to small farmers to enable them to increase production. We brought in the bauxite levy because yes. Jamaica was earning pittance from all over the economy growing on the back of bauxite. The actual tax revenue to the government to help pay for goods and services for the people was very small. We designed a production levy which said, based on the world alumina price, amount of production from Jamaica, this is the tax that must be paid. And it brought in hundreds of millions of US dollars of revenue. Yes. Unfortunately, at the time, the oil, we had a major oil shock of the early 1970s where OPEC and the um, price of oil went through the roof. And that really hurt um, all countries that were dependent on oil. But if it weren't for the levy, we probably wouldn't have survived that. Mm -hmm. So these are just some of the things that were done. Workers' rights, Wayne. Before, a man could just fire you. And as a worker, all you could do is, if you had the money and could pay a lawyer, try your luck in court. But court could never order reinstatement. And if, you could, if, and if, the, if, a, if the man was entitled to give notice, the most money you could get out of him was the, was the salary for the period of the notice. 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, depending on your contract of employment. We created the Industrial Disputes Tribunal and so that if you had a dispute in the workplace or you were wrongfully, in what was called unjustifiably dismissed, you could go to the tribunal. And that was a, a tribunal in which workers were represented in the tribunal. Employers were represented in the tribunal. It had power to order reinstatement. So if you are wrongly dismissed from your job, they could order the employer to take you back and they could award compensation for being unjustifiably dismissed. The, we brought in redundancy pay and notice pay law, industrial dispute, uh, indus, um, termination and, um, and redundancy payments act. So that if, 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 a, if a company decides it wants to downsize off, you never just on the bone of your you know what with no money to survive you would you're entitled to a redundancy payment depending on how long you would work there so these were liberating things and remember as well michael manley led the fight against apartheid internationally you know of course he was a great course. advocate to bring down the racist regime of south africa yes and you know that is why nelson mandela the great nelson mandela yes. when he came on, on the first place First was Jamaica case. because yes, of the respect yes. due to Michael Manley for his advocacy and his courage because it was a, it took courage because at the time certain powers that be in the world didn't like his advocacy on behalf of truths and rights. So yes. Michael Manley was a great leader. He was yes. a visionary leader and he and he was a leader who 
wanted Jamaica a much more fair and balanced and just society. Yes. So is, errors were made, he, but he was destabilized. The government was destabilized deliberately. And t- capital flight people the country with their money. Yes. People hoarded goods so that it created crisis. And the murder rate went through the roof because of political violence. Because um, more the all that more well, no no the whole of that. Um mm-hmm. and the thing, the, the, the NH, the, the, the National Housing Trust. Thank you. That didn't make feel, you know, I just I just say something with the, the Prime Minister saying no, you know, you can't have three people come together and, and you know get loan for how oh, that work. Because mm-hmm. if you have you and your wife, or you want you for a look cub now. You and 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 three persons have to make up forget a little coup. No, the, 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 this was the same prime minister. I think what in opposition said poor people for have big house. So oh, you and three persons for come together forget one little coup. And why them use the NHT money? You know, if it sells some place to 30, 30 odd million, when them talk about out how many, can't be hypocritical. When they be hypocritical, me try it against them. Yeah, it's wrong. They must put down the masses. It's wrong. Yeah. The National Housing Trust was again one of the transformational reforms of my command in that period, where employees and workers make a small contribution each month to the fund, and they earn points. Earn points. The employers' money make up on top of it, and helps them to buy a home. and And the NHT can provide mortgages and relatively soft terms and that was really to, designed to empower persons who would not otherwise be able to buy a house because they would never have the resources to do so buy a home and it also nht was also a developer and helped to develop low-income housing which would which was affordable to persons who were earning wages so it was a liberating institution and a very visionary i think it has lost its way because it is now in the development market at the higher end, trying to make profit out of building units that sell for prices, as you said, over thirty million dollars. When there's very little going on at the end of the market, where there's a huge shortage of housing, which is the the the, the kind of homes that can be afforded by you know the typical person earning an either minimum wage or close to minimum wage. So that is an issue which we want to address when we're next in office and really refocus the housing trust to help persons who need that leg up to get. In terms of the three signatories on a mortgage, my understanding has been tried before and, and was not successful. And that quite often between the three who signed was strained by this because not everybody was getting the benefit. And those who weren't getting the benefit felt, well, why should I be paying? Because I'm not fit. And then sometimes those loans weren't serviced as they should be. So it has, as I understand it, it has been tried before and was not successful. I don't know why we're going back there. You know why? Because if you think about this, three signature signing for getting one house, that will cause war, that will cause all kind of violence. Because mm-hmm. I paid up on something, you and, and, and someone else there, and you know, oh that share, oh it go. Mm. And I can't send my own because you have to sign and, and that other person have to sign. Yeah. And, and then one person wanna take it over. So it caused a lot of things in family or with family and friends and what have you. And the worst thing you ever hear. Yeah. And yeah. just the Prime Minister come with these kind of things. After him sell out, him sell a lot more things, you know. I'm mm-hmm. gonna show you something. I don't think I can play, you know, I play some visual when I ask you. Yeah, I'm want to know about your government, what kind of step you're going to take to move these kind of people, because I think politicians should be honest to the people who them serving, but not to come and tell them lies and would wink and trick them. You understand? And them to serve the country with dignity. Yeah. Not for putting them friend and rob the resources mm. and trample the small man. It's so wrong. It is. You understand? So... It's it wrong. So I'm going to play something here. And, and you know, when a politician can just tell blatant lie like this, I can't believe in him, you know. So I'm going to play mm-hmm. something and, and then, you know, I will ask a question. Because I just come to this. I just want you to hear this good. Just listen to this first. 
Sure. I was born in a two bedroom board house at 56 Cumberland Road in a Spanish town. Just down the road from the grass yard market, my father is still a farmer and my mother is a retired civil servant who sent the two of us, me and my sister, to school on a civil servant salary. I never born with no gold spoon in my mouth. I know what it is to go to school and I have no lunch money. But my parents teach me pride. My parents say don't beg and don't make nobody know when you're in need. And I never beg none of them, not yet. All right, so him say that member in barn in a two bedroom board house, right? And uh, with him mom and dad and everybody, right? And him, him parents are telling this, you know, because if I can't take something else from him right here, and then I'm gonna play something else and I'm gonna ask you something. Dad, else. My mother tell me to work hard. I grew up with the ethic of work and study. It is education and my hard work that has got me where I am today, along with the help of caring parents, caring family, and good friends. Good friends, okay. So you will never hear me bad mind nobody for them Finsack house. You will never hear me bad mind nobody for them squatter land where them are live pan. You will so in, in, if it's a squatter land, you must have talked to some of the people them who have blow the hands the same way, right? All right, mm -hmm. that's just one, right? That totally disrespect. But me just I'll show you something else and then I'm going to ask you the question. All right, me could just see this one now. This one I want to ask. So I'm born with mom and dad and everyone, right? I me, me could just see this one. Could just stop it. Go down here. Right, just see this one. And as I stand here today, I tell you that I'm born poor. I was born in Spanish town, grew up at 56 Summerland Road, in a board house, one bedroom, one. grew up with my great grandmother, great grandmother, single parent house, single parent, who's Jimmy, who's Jimmy, who walk to school, walk to school, sit down in a classroom with 60 picnic band, listen. Now, this, we have a problem with that now, you, you know, you are running mm. an election. And and clearly in about 1972. So, you know, when you're 16, you're going to grade one and at 78 in a manly time. I mm -hmm. never, well, me born in the 60s. I never me too. saw no one in a no, no class at all with no 60 kid, much as in a manly time. 60 kid in mm -hmm. a one class. One at a time, you go up to, you know, you have money shift for evening shift. And in mm -hmm. band, remember, you know, him said, Bodos. Great grandmother, single parent, used Jimmy in a class with 60 kids, but on the next podium, and people not take this. Oh, me take a man like this, truthful. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. This is our problem what we have with politicians. And and when we want to ask you, no, in barn in a in a two-bedroom, we have the same address. <laughs> this time with the mother and the father and the sister. And she has civil servant, civil servant, and middle uh, second class, uh, middle class citizen, those mm, time, right? Sure. Civil servant, and you must oh. make nobody nothing. Then I, I, I mother, and parents, family, and good friend help him. I don't say I make nobody nothing. <laughs> oh, my match these things. Oh, we listen to politicians like this. Oh, politicians like these for turn leaders of a country. Mm. What kind of example this them setting? You understand? That's yeah. why the country running down. What you would do different when um because Michael Mandela said no arrogance in a no party. Not yeah. when he in, in a that. What yeah. you you will do different if you form the next government by vetting some of these, you know, you, you have some other um candidate coming in, or you that or you that structure the vetting process. Because we can't deal with them kind of people anymore, you know. Now we spent hmm. the twenty two. And we're tired of these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, well, when there's a lot of distrust and cynicism about politics and politics in the country, and the truth is, it's because persons say things that they know not to be true, 
to try and get votes, make promises that they know they can never deliver to try and get votes. And when they're in government, they put their friends into influence over public resources. And those persons have all too often in recent times looted those resources for their own benefit and the benefit of their cronies. And who knows who else got kickback money as well. We'll never know. So this is very distasteful. And this camp, the country needs to have a sense of assurance that the leaders are persons of integrity and whose word can be relied on. No, perfect. And I'm not claiming to be perfect by any means. But I believe that honesty matters, integrity matters. And, you know, I approach, I'm coming into this politics relatively late in my life. I didn't come in politics in my 20s. You know, I, I became a senator when I was, I think, uh, in 2007. So I would have been 42 then. I'd already had a career as a, as a, as a lawyer and a business person. And I, I felt the opportunity now to give back. And I was in a position to serve in that capacity and ever since. So I'm not here to scrape. And I don't support any kind of activity where people are ripping off the public purse because that money is needed for the people. There are many, many people in Jamaica who, ha are, who have needs for better education, better health care, better police service, better training, and better housing conditions and infrastructure, everything. So when a man is using his influence to rip off institutions by contracts with his own business or business thing and that kind of thing, and the pricing is not at arm's length, the procurement rules are not followed, that is a siphoning of public resources away from its intended purpose to benefit the few instead of the many. I'm against that, and I intend to do whatever I can to ensure when our time comes, we won't allow that to happen. Now, what has been done recently, which I hope will make a difference, is there are actions that have been passed and not yet in effect, but they have been approved by Parliament with how the public boards um, are appointed and require that there be a, a pool of talent where persons who want to serve put their names up and they are then vetted. And anybody, any minister who wishes to appoint somebody has to draw that from that pool to do it. It's a better system. I helped Nigel Clark with the development of it. He asked my views. I shared some of my ideas with him. And it's taken a very long time because it was resisted in Parliament initially by some people, vested interests who were uncomfortable with some aspects. It has now been approved. I'm hoping that when it goes into effect, it will be standard of governance. That's my hope. We'll, we remain to be seen. In terms of the PNP, we have an integrity commission with five elders on it, persons of solid reputation, and all of our candidates have to go before them and they have to fill out a fit and proper questionnaire, which is similar to the questionnaire that Bank of Jamaica uses for persons who want to become managers in the financial sector. It's a very comprehensive questionnaire, and they have to swear that what they declare in that questionnaire is true. And then they can be interrogated by the Integrity Commission. And if they don't, if the Integrity doesn't say that they are fit and proper, then they can't go forward as our candidate. So that's a system that was introduced under Portia Simpson Miller. She was the one who put that in place. And it's a very important institution that we need to make sure we continue continue with because it should give the public confidence in our candidates that these are not just any, any persons who have been vetted. And, you know, so my own career is one of integrity. I, you know, I have, I'm known for that in the, in the community, the business community, which I used to be part of. Um, as a as a business person, but also as a as a corporate lawyer, and uh, you know my my call is to is, I've come to, towards the second half of my career to move our country forward because I think we need people who have the right approach. Who are, you know, I in in my constituency, my my slogan was clean heart and clean hands, 
and that's an important message, you know, about, you know, and what you believe in and, and how you would rule if you were given that responsibility by the people. So that is what my commitment is, you know, to, to lead with integrity and to lead in the best interest of the people as a whole, especially the masses of the people, which is what the PNP was formed to do. You know, where, where we believe in all classes place in the society. We want all classes, top, middle, bottom, all to be part of the society. But the common objective must be to empower those who need to be uplifted and empowered and who, because of historical reasons, didn't always have it and may still not have it. But we need to build a society where everybody has somebody. And that is our mission. You know, some people feel because you, you, you are more easygoing. And you more remind me of Michael Mann, the easygoing, right? Some people feel, you know, today's politics have to make bag nice, like Andrew Olness do and, and did. And make a bag of nice and tell a lot of lies because me just show him my pint to out pint blank. Mm. I don't have to say, you, you know, him do this, I pint to out coming in from his mouth. Yeah. Telling like his grandmother, him great grandmother, our mother and father and brother and everything where him say, you know, from one pour them to the other, right? A man like this not fit for lead, not even a hog pen. And I'm, I'm, I just talk straight. Yeah. Okay? It shouldn't be in Jamaica that we have leaders. What kind of example you set? It's supposed to be a um, road model that people can look upon you and say, yes, we have a good prime minister. and that. But when a man so like, what, what you can believe in him? Mm -hmm. So what you will do different because we know your you know your we know your CV we know your your your, your resume you know as a businessman and, and 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 as a as a corporate liar right and you know because we don't want no more people and in the kitty mm -hmm. you know some people come and them they broke when they go to school just the other day and then by you know you run up in the politics them value more than two hundred million mm -hmm. but not even prime minister pay per year is not nine million dollar. How that work? What you will do now if you form the next government? Would you promise us to do some very serious investigation, reform the police force because we have to get rid of criminality and corruption out of the society? I'm going to play a next video about that too. You know, with Singapore, I have to pay it, make you hear it. Okay, reform mm -hmm. that because you have a lot of police them them um them politically aligned. And we need mm. that to stop. We need professional in the force. Yeah. Professionalism. Jamaica yeah, can move forward with these kind of people who are not professional. I agree. They are politically aligned. Mm. And this we are run from. The masses of people are run from it. Not yeah. just win loans because we talk for millions of people. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We are run from this. We want people who are honest. And like a man leader says, we stick to the sheep like a Past, like a, a shepherd mm -hmm. and when them hurt him hurt him feel the earth so him do something not for use police and trample the people after you said yes poor man for you have big house and everything now you have to tell about three what you will do different because enough of these people need to investigate it yeah and some people need to go to prison so we just ask you what you will do if you farm the next government we don't business we're just talking straight yeah uh, uh, yes well we we have tried to build the structures and systems that will address some of these issues. So MOCA, the major and anti-corruption task force, which is a fully vetted unit. Everybody in it has to go have testing and has to be properly vetted. We established that to try and tackle corruption and organized crime, which is causing so much mayhem in the society. The Integrity Commission, which has prosecutorial powers, that was something we developed. I developed that, to be honest. That based with we did a study with um, some advisors as to what would be a good system to have. One of the things it allows, for example, is the sharing of information between of, of law enforcement and tax authorities in the country. That never used to be possible. Now they can share, and in fact, they are mandated to share information to try and tackle the kind of corruption we have in this society. We in cases for acts of corruption substantially because they were out of date and inadequate so all of that has been done but we're not yet reaping the benefits of it i think it's fair to say that those institutions are relatively new 
and they are finding their feet and we must give them some time to come into their own. I accept that. But I also feel that, you know, who you put where in what positions is, is important when you're building new institutions. And we need to ensure that we have people in those positions who are completely above reproach and who are very committed to the task at hand and that won't use those powers in a corrupt way themselves. This is very important. So what I would say is that we will, we, we will continue to strive to ensure that that institutional architecture for fire works efficiently. We will ensure that they have adequate resources to do their job. And we will try our best to ensure that the people who are in leadership in those institutions are trustworthy and competent people who are not politically affiliated, but are just straight professionals. In terms of the force, so very critical. Uh, you know, and I agree with you that the, the, the force has been plagued over many years with the politicization of elements of the force, including in the leadership of the force. And this is not a good thing. This undermines public trust and confidence in the police and gives people the impression that the police can be used as a tool for political ends and that certain persons don't get can get away with anything because of, and other persons are going to be targeted. And that is not the kind of society that we want for Jamaica. You know, we want a Jamaica which is governed on the base and that if you stand by principle, Wayne, you, you don't go wrong. You may have to make some unpopular decisions in the near term. But at the long, on the, in the long run, you will be vindicated. I mean, I think, for example, when we stood up and said, no more states of emergency, you can't be using the state of emergency like it's a curfew, like it's something that you just use for policing purposes. It is the last resort to protect democracy and the democratic system of governance from, from being overthrown. That is why it exists in the Constitution. And that is why when it is rolled out, you cannot scrape up anybody. And you can hold them in detention and they don't have a right of access to the court. It's a very serious thing. No, that is not why state of emergency existed. You cannot use it just as an ordinary policing tool. You have the Zozo legislation, you can use that. You have cordon of search, you have more and more powers of intelligence, DNA legislation that we passed. You have MOCA now that we use these tools effectively and you can get this thing more under control. And you have to inspire trust and confidence with your international partners so that they can with you in a way that they may be reluctant to if they think that your ministers are corrupt. That is also That has also been a problem. And so these are the things I'm very mindful of. And I'm committed to doing the best I can to ensure that Jamaica starts to be ruled on the basis of principle and transparency and not on the basis of partisan political interest or personal gain for individual politicians who are not there and are not elected by the people to enrich themselves, but are elected by the people to serve the people, honestly. Yes. And the next thing, and the next thing, right? The next note. As a banker, right? Do you think it's better for Jamaicans, yeah, for the government, to guarantee and make sure these banks, come back in the 70s and coming up, right? Even when you're going to school, you have people from the bank used to come to school and make sure you have a bank, you open a bank account. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it's better for all Jamaicans to even have a bank account instead of them putting so much red tape? Because, for instance, I just want to say something to you. If I am a gardener, because mm -hmm. it, 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 it all serves for good, you know. If I am a gardener, and then all of a sudden I come and bank 100 million into their bank account, and I cannot get account to that, that will raise a red flag. So if you are the government and, and, and it was a red flag and I cannot answer to that, it's going to be seized and I'm going to be in trouble, right? And then that money could fix road or do something. Why are them stopping these people from having a bank account? Mm. Are overcharging them with these every prices, um, every um fees, um, fees mm. and charges. Why? Yeah. You can't move a country like this. No. I agree. I think that efforts have been made to bring more people into the banking system. Um, and in order to do that, you have to have arrangements that persons who don't have a lot and are saved, they can afford to save, are not being penalized by the bank charging them for basic transactions to do with their account, lodging money, cashing checks, making withdrawals. 
that should not be a source of income to banks for persons who have relatively modest amounts of money in their account. That is just depleting their already meager resources and enriching the shareholders at the expense of the public, especially the members of the public who are really margins. On the other hand, we do want to encourage people to open bank accounts because I can tell you, I hear stories regularly of people who save in their yard and the house burn down and all their money burn up. That happens quite often and leave them with nothing. So courage. And also you have people who get paid and, and then they get robbed and then salary, the entire salary get taken from them because they're on the road going home and man joke them down and take out their money. So we need to get to a point where persons the banking system in a way that doesn't penalize them because they're not wealthy. And that is why Fitz Jackson's legislation is important because he developed this legislation for people by giving them the right to a basic package of services each month for which they can't be charged fees. And then in the bank can charge, but there was a certain number of transactions per month that should they should get free of fees. And they can't charge fees to dormant accounts and eat those out as well. Where persons have their money, but they haven't been drawing on it. And then the, the account goes into dormancy and then they start lick it with fees and take out the money. No. Unfortunately, there has been... The government has turned, t- turned tail on this because there was a committee of parliament that developed that legislation. The ideas behind that legislation signed off on it people are now in cabinet were on that committee and yet when the bill now was developed on the big report and had in it what the report said should be done and the spread consultation when that report was being prepared the legislation was prepared table um every single one of them voted against it and we uh, didn't have a majority at the time we were in opposition and it hasn't passed fitz has re- it is back in Parliament again. I don't know what the government is going to do about it because I remember a few months ago, January, I think, where Mr. Holness and Nigel, Dr. Clark, were are not living in the world that we're living in and they're being unfair and, you know, they start to lick out, but they have not done anything. And that legislation is there to do something, but they don't seem to want to support it. I don't understand why. But we are committed to ensuring that the banking system encourages persons to come into it and use those services for their own protection and to enable them to be to save in a in a in a, in a way that doesn't expose them to undue there must be a, a way in which they can do that without being subject to fees that regularly deplete what they have because these are people who don't have a lot so the banks must give them a specific package and i know that some of the banks have been trying to do this special accounts that are now available where it's easier to open the account. You don't need to jump through, provide as much information, but they're, you know, but the accounts have to be below a certain amount. And, you know, let us see how that plays out. We want to see, and I believe the government is offering an incentive. So they're paying, I think, $10,000 to the first hundred people who open these accounts. And, and, you know, let us see wh- whether that makes any difference, but, we, you know, we are committed to a system of banking with some consumer protection in it. In the same way that there are other areas of the economy where there's consumer protection. There's consumer protection with the, the you know, certain prices. Transportation is a sector where prices are managed by the state for, to protect the commuting public. Financial services of that level is like a utility. It's like electricity or water. You know, it's something that people need to have access to to just go about their daily lives. So there's no, to me, I know my, Nigel Cart was saying, no, we believe in the market and we believe that the price must be set by supply and demand. But the banks are not really a free market because two major control the vast majority of deposits in the country. And, you know, if they choose not to really compete on price because it suits them to make money by not really competing on price, then who's to protect the consumer? You know, and the truth is that they're not being protected. So... This is why I think the legislation that Fitzjackson developed is worthy of support. So you're telling me now, right? So the, um, the Prime Minister, uh, when 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 he was in the opposition, he talked the things them, you know, they just, you know, please the masses. 
things where they want here. But when him, when him, when him, when you put him, when him actually in office, him join the elites and don't business about the masses again. It clear, it clear that it 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 it, it, it sure it's sure in that, you know. Yeah. It's sure in that. Well, I it's certainly feel on the banking fees thing, they have basic, I don't know if they've sold out or what, but they have definitely moved from being fully on board with a set of reforms that they agreed was necessary, signed up, and yet for some reason, when the time came to implement it through legislation, and said, no, we can't support this, it don't make sense, it's a wrong, the, it, it, it's full of errors and so on, but they never pointed out anything wow. specific that was wrong with it. In Parliament, you know, when a bill is being debated, if there's a clause where you think going in the wrong direction, you say, well, I think this needs to be amended. And you argue it out. And if, if it's persuasive, yes, we amend it. Our legislation is... They never did any of that. They just said, no, we don't want to support this thing. It's flaw. Not one flaw was identified. And they have done nothing to address the problem since. Even though at the time, Audley Shaw was a minister of finance and said Bank of Jamaica was coming with a solution in six months. Nothing has come. And that was two, three years ago. Wow. So the, the situation has remained un unresolved and unaddressed. And, you know, we've, it's, it's an important thing because it's a thing that many people feel strongly about. You know, that them get a little check now and them cash it. The bank take $330 out of it. And, you know, why? It's their money. Why is that happening? Or they look on every time they make a withdrawal charge, or, you know. So, look, banks are in business to make money. I fully understand that. But there is a level that means in a third world country, yeah. The most people, them don't the masses don't really have it, them don't even have an account. Yeah, and the one them who does mm -hmm. you, you're doing this and shutting them down. That That's don't make sense. All the country grow. Quite so you got to have very the super rich and the super poor. Okay. And it and it's bad. That's it bad. Is bad. It is bad, and that's not it. This was a man division, you know. This is some, you know, some people, it's true and we have, it's true and us have. Someone said to ask, right? Chat truth. Asking about why, um, said to ask Mr. Golden, you know, the returning resident, why them charge so, so much excessive fees at the wharf. Returning resident? Yeah. When them coming in, why them charging so much excessive fees? Why them charging them so, so many excessive fees to clear must get them things or something? Yes. Yeah, my understanding was that there was an arrangement in play that if a returning resident was bringing home items, they could go to customs, and as long as they could establish that they were a returning resident, there were certain taxes that they were granted. I that's my understanding of how the system works. I'm, I can't speak to the specifics of it now because I haven't checked it out recently, but there was always an understanding that. We want to encourage our people to come home, people who have gone abroad, lived and maybe have made done well over there, come home now. We must encourage that because they can help build our society and build our economy. So you don't want to penalize them with a lot of fees and so on to bring home the basics of what they need to live here. So that principle, I thought, was, was, was fully supported, and I'm sorry to hear and you know something we'll have to look into all right tell me something now if you elected the prime minister from the next government what your first hundred days will be what it would what it would be looking like your first hundred days as yeah. a prime minister you can't know well, thing after revamping yeah and, and 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 that's true yeah but what 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 the people then would look at yeah i would be looking at First 100 days. Well, where, where the priorities should be are early childhood development, education, and training. We have studies, recent studies, World Bank, the Orlando Patterson Report, two different studies indicating that our school system is failing a high percentage of our, of our children and that they are going through the school system and they're not with the necessary skills, educational skills. And this means that we have very few opportunities in the job market and so on. And the problems don't start in secondary school. They start early. Because we know we have a lot of families with we have teenage pregnancies, single home, single parent homes, some 
strong, but some are not. And we need to put in place systems that really focus on fixing the problem, I believe, at the early childhood development and primary school. So that would be our where we would be focusing attention significantly to try and level up the standards in the primary school. So instead of having close to 50%, when it comes to grade six, they are not able to read and write and add and subtract. We need, there's no good reason for that. These are not children. These are just children who maybe their home environment is not conducive. Maybe the schools haven't been focusing on their needs and the teachers haven't been coping well in the class. We need to tackle that. And we need to show that the necessary resources are, because that is a source of how we get Jamaica to where we want it to go. Because the yes. children are bright and bright. Other areas I'm interested in is, for example, agriculture and really trying to help our farmers. You know, emphasis on farm roads so they can get their products out. The, the, the price of fertilizer, I, there needs to be some assistance to farmers when, when fertilizer prices become unmanageable, produce food on a more affordable level. And we don't, you know, we're spending over a billion dollars a year US on importing food. A lot of it is food that can be grown here. We need to encourage our investment in agriculture by putting in the necessary um, infrastructure around roads, irrigation, and, and also some of the prices of inputs to uh, people to get more efficient. These are some of the things that we will be looking at, things that can help to transform the society. We want to see broadband internet brought to every home in Jamaica because we see it in the same way that in the 70s, electricity was not available to many, many people in Jamaica. My father had built a little small house up in a place called near Constitution Hill, near mm -hmm. Dallas. It's about 15 minutes drive from Papin. And when I was growing up, we used to spend weekends there. And there was no light. We had a generator, a thing called a Delco, with a, that he had to crank it to start it. And once you cranked it up and it started to run, it ran on kerosene. We had to carry kerosene and, and fill it, the tank and every weekend. And that could run about three lights and a fridge in the house, you know. And but no, we were the only house for miles around that had electricity. And then the rural electrification program was brought in by Michael Manley. And by the, a few years later, the entire district had light and still does. And I think internet needs to be seen as a utility like that because it is the source of empowerment for people. Yes, it can be abused too. So, you know, people can use, look at unwholesome things and to disparage people. And they're, 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 But at the same time, it enables people to have access to information and knowledge. It creates opportunities to market goods and services and people can, small entrepreneurs can make a business out of clever use of the internet and it provides employment opportunities where people in Jamaica can work for companies abroad wages and salaries at the level that is available in other and is not available here and they don't need a visa to do that they don't need a green card or nothing they can once have access to the internet so we believe that building out the internet is fundamental the government is making a start at it it's been moving slowly I mean, what, for example, they have a program now where in each constituency they are having three Wi-Fi hotspots. But it's great, and we appreciate it, and I want to thank the Universal Service Fund for the work with that. But the truth of the matter is it's just a drop in the bucket because I think it has a range not of... So, not so safe, you know, Mr. Golden. Yeah. Not, not so, because, you see, these hotspots, when you mm -hmm. go and use your system there, it's not safe. You have some, you. It's not safe. It 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 much cheaper for you know you have some little box of four thousand a month and, and and a lot of people. I better you, you have it where my woman I might have used it with the next woman even two two um but have a hot spot where everyone come and you open up your device and use it. Not safe. Mm -hmm. And then them cards and a lot of money. It could have paid for these little four four thousand boxes. In all these, and it, and it work out enough time cheaper because I see that and then tell you much billion it value. That's crap. Mm -hmm. They are doing crap, and it, it just look like it look it look good enough. But I'm, I I can just tell them straight that's crap. Yeah, them never do nothing yet to really uplift the masses of people like how Joshua did come and lift the masses with all kind of thing. Can you tell me now 
um um can you point out some of these things the present government do for uplift the jamaican people in the, the last six years since i'm in power you see anything you can point out like michael mandy you could point out something about michael mandy wow well in terms of legislation no that's something for uplift the people yeah, yeah i'm just thinking of what what i can think of that yes. i would say has been very impactful on people's lives you know they've they've built some roads um, roads is a, is a necessity is a must is. but most and of the I can tell you that yeah the mm -hmm. emphasis on major roads was important because i yes. think it has helped the economy to have things like major highways the north coast highway uh, the south coast highway which is being built now and so on but i think we have to start looking at what about all the rooms what about the infrastructure where people yeah. live what and about even that? The schemes where people live a lot of the schemes where people live the roads are terrible okay. terrible and they have to drive on these awful roads and these roads just need some patching and repairs and they're totally neglected so I think if you're talking about where you're going to, you know, why not do some road maintenance and try and make people's so, access to their homes? So in other, in other fairness, you're trying to find something, what them do and, and roads, what is a necessity. In, no, in any developed country at all, any developed country, whether America, Canada, UK and thing, no politician went on road and water and light, none. Because yeah. that always have to be, they always have to fix it. And that mm -hmm. is the truth. That means they don't do nothing. What them do is come with with um state of emergency and lock up the ghetto youth them who do mm. have a job, leaving school like forty thousand every every year and don't have nothing to turn to blank wall. And you take them and lock them up and give them um police record. That means them can't even go look in employment overseas because they will never get a visa. We can't destroy the youth them like this. It's yeah. wrong. Them need uh to stop it. I would say that they, this government has really not been a transformational government. Six years. Yes. I think they have really come into office in 2016 on the basis of the reforms that were done over the four years before, which were fundamental, agreed with the IMF, very challenging, but ha which have really set the, a much stronger position. And they've basically written that and a lot of the things that were in the pipeline, even in the justice sector which I was responsible for as minister. Many of the things that have happened since were things that I had taken. But, you know, we were only in office for four years. We couldn't do everything. We, you know, we decriminalized the ganja, created the opportunity for a new medical and therapeutic ganja industry. Eliminated. Um, we revamped the whole expungement system. Some of the rules around dead left policy. Um, the laws for dead left to allow people to inherit property that would have been tied up in estates for years and to create a new solution where the administrator general can cut that pro cut through that problem and deliver to the beneficiaries which had been tied up for years. We did a lot of things. But since then, uh, what Mr. Chok has rolled out was essentially things that we had taken to an advanced stage. The child diversion policy, restorative justice. These are policies and, and legislation that was many other. So I would say that, you know, they have really not been um very effective in bringing major change to to change to turn the country around they have managed the economy on the pathway that it had already been set and there have been we have seen but, but, the, uh, can i say something mm -hmm. I, I i heard when when the prime minister or uh, this government was in opposition said um when you people was dealing with the imf said listen that can help poor people can't put things in them pocket. You are managing IMF, but you're not managing people. Them what them going to eat? But no, mm. look what happened now. The dollar, the same dollar. What them talking about? When we like 190, 120, nearly 160. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. all kind of thing. But here still is a free market now, and everything is okay. It can't work. So become a whole them by account. I hold mm. people by account. So if yeah. they come and tell me one thing, and then me see them do the other. When yes. they're in government, I'm going to hold them to account, and we're going to open people's eyes to these things. Yeah, yeah. Right, but You're... as I said before, because mm -hmm. we're going to run, you know, because we still wrap up some time, like hour and a half. But um, yeah, as I, I, have a, before, I have a setup to go to. Um, it's been a long day, but I promised one of my um seniors in the party, he, his wife passed, and the setup is tonight. So I have to go. I, you know, I told him I'd be there at eight thirty. So you know, yeah. Two thing, two thing left, right? Yeah, yeah I got to make you run now. But um, 
one one um an immigration officer tell me to ask about some position at the immigration at the Pika office because they write to everyone there and cannot get no justice. If you turn um the next from the next government, you're going to do some reform that people that government can't put in them friend that them angle good workers or them angle them or them treat them. Yeah. This this need to stop. I'm away. I think I'm aware. Experience going and just doing what they want to do. Like I, Buckmaster. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. I I believe I'm aware of the specific case that you're referring to because it was brought to my attention this body. And I have passed it to our shadow spokesman for national security because Pika falls under that portfolio yes. to see what we can do about that specific case. But the broader issue of how persons are handled, you know, one of the problems is this contract work concept where persons are given fixed contracts for short periods of time and then it is renewed for short period after short period after short period. And get 10, 11 years. 10, 11 years and they don't have any, they don't have any benefits treated as full-time employees but are treated as short-term contract workers. We intend to stop that. And he asked about the first 100 days. That is one of the things that we are going to tackle within that period. That is a source of serious injustice in this society where per workers are being the basic clutch of rights that have been hard fought for over many generations. And we feel that that is wrong. And other countries have been able to achieve a solution to that through legislation. So that is something we will be tackling. And it applies in the public sector as well as the private sector. Yes. All right. The next thing I'm going to ask you now. So for the youths, them know who, you know, turn to a blank wall, feed there is no hopes because I said put the kids them first. Right? No job, leave school, no job, nothing to turn to. Maybe there's a spliff and a sit on and nothing. Right? What we're going to do for these young men who are coming up because they, they are the future of the country, you know. We can't just lock them up and I give them police record and I finish them off. It's, it, 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 it can't work no more. You can't. We have I mean, to do something. I think we need a national program to tackle that issue. I think there needs to be a program where any youngster that leaves school who is not in car, in an apprenticeship, in a job, but in the community, not doing anything constructive, there needs to be an opportunity provided for that youth where that youth can get some remedial education. If his master is English isn't up to scratch, you help him with that so him have, can so them can have the basic qualifications that would enable them to now go into a, into a structured training program. You give them some skills training. You give them some mentorship. You give them a stipend. And you try and condition them. Some of them are heading in the wrong direction. And they are very vulnerable to be caught up in badness and crime. You need to turn their lives around and reorient them. It needs to be a holistic. It needs to be a national program. It's going to cost money to do it. But I think that's money well spent because those are the youths who end up being the, the, the gang members and, you know, and create havoc in the community, many of them, because they don't have nothing looking forward to in life. And they want, like anybody else, they want to be somebody. And the way they can get respect and so on is true badness. We have to give them another path. So that is an important element of what we need to do. We need a proper... There was once a national... A national another program from the 70s that was designed because, so we'll go back to michael because i better go back yeah, to michael yeah, man because the man, was a, the man was a visionary he was but a visionary was, i tell yeah. you i'm a man the ice i don't yeah. think he's a yeah. visionary i mean the maybe, was a visionary. maybe some of his ideas were the leader, before their time I don't, country. when you look yes. back on them so many of them make sense still. Maybe not in the exact form of that time because they were designed for an era which no longer exists. But the basic principles of the state ensuring that so-called unattached use, vulnerable use, the state doesn't just leave them alone and say, police, you deal with that. Wrong. That, can't, that can't be right. Can't be wrong. right. And we need, no. to, we need to tackle it and we need to have a national program that is focused on that. Yes. And that is something which I spoke to in my budget presentation and I am committed to us doing it. I can't tell you that we've finished the design of it, but the basic principles of what it would be seeking to do, we have articulated what those are.
Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So we have to go back to some of those principles that Michael Mandy set back in the 70s because those principles, they're working on today. You yeah. know what? Even when Andrew in opposition, he used some of these same words, um, okay. self-reliance, free, free education, free, free access, health. all yeah. of them live on these things. But remember, man, they put it into play. Mm -hmm. Because remember when we used to go to, you know, clinics, clinic better than the hospital today. We used to even have dentists at the clinics. Free dentists. Yeah. We had a great yeah, public everything. health. And, you know, community health aids. And, yes. we, and you know, there was a of ensuring that children were properly inoculated persons or pressure they were you know that they were monitored as they should be and and, and the pmp has done some good things you know the drug for elderly program the national health fund these are things that were done more recently and which have really helped but there's still this free health notion is, is just propaganda there is if you even jamaica you know if you get sick if you need an implant for That's surgery it. or you need anything other than the basic package of drugs uh, it, 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 you need diagnostic tests you better have money otherwise dog now my supper i i can i can i i, I make a see maybe you're not going to see this but a young lady right me call a lot of people write me in about help right and this young man right you know i do a thing on him 33 shot you know and you know no foot come out everything you know you know where i try to give him some help you have a next one in portland he, he have um him can't walk. His mom sit down 17 years her foot stiff. If you have dad was around, maybe him that do something for her and yeah. for that young man. And him, him, him want to do some work. And next young lady write me, she's supposed to do some things. And the hospital put her out right now because she wants a pin in her foot that break around a couple of months, two, two years ago. And right now her foot swell like this. Uh. And she had to him. And the next yeah. one of us, somebody say, my next one with her jaw, the whole light swell off and she'll beg help. And they must have free, free health system. Mm. The day well, has to come in and act in. You know, man, something has to be done. Something has to be done. Something you has to be done. Because yeah. all the country running is just friend, company, the elites, private sectors, not the masses of people. They use the masses of people as scapegoat just for voting and mm. lies and plan and tricks. It must stop. Yeah? Good to have you, you know. We have to talk yeah. again because a lot of people, I know you have to move, but you know, nice to oh, have you. Yes, well, man. I appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas with you. Yes. I thank you for your questions and for your commitment to your country. Great yes. work you're doing with your your um, blogging and, and, you know, keep it yes. up. And, yes. um, you know, we'll talk again, I hope. All right. It's always a pleasure. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. All right, take cool care. All okay. right, bye-bye.